So I just wanted to say, first off, thank you very much for uh, having us. Um, <clears throat> these two reports actually would not are, are are very much the progeny of some of some Irish uh, kinfolk. At Lisa Ryan, who's not here but was formerly of the IEA, so she really kicked the ball off yeah. on the multiple benefits uh, report. Lorcan here as well, uh, who was uh, very big in in uh, producing the energy efficiency market report, which we'll get into later. Uh, Emer Dennehy as well, who provided a lot of the, the, the background analysis. So that, in a way, that's one of the reasons why we're here, just to, just to say thanks and, and to uh, uh, you know, promote this type of work uh, here in Ireland. And, and it's, it, you've, you've been a, a, a big help in, in the work that we've been doing so far. So um, <clears throat> basically, the energy efficiency unit at the, at the IEA uh, has, has really taken a step forward within the organization. The, the outgoing executive director, Maria Vanderhoven, has really prioritized energy efficiency. She's really recognized the role that it has. You know, the IEA tends sometimes have to have a, an image of being, you know, this, this stuffy organization that looks at oil and coal and that kind of thing. But actually, we're very much committed to uh, sustainability and climate change and energy efficiency places extremely prominently there. And so she's been a big advocate. So the energy efficiency unit of which we're a part of uh, has really stepped up. And, uh, and, and what we've really noticed is that energy efficiency, I mean, we're, we're talking with people such as yourself, which I imagine are, are already the, you're already the, the uh, choir, we're, we're, we're preaching to the choir here in a way. But what the, the goal of a lot of these reports is, is to really bridge that gap between the departments of energy and that kind of thing to the Department of Finance, to other policymakers, try and make energy efficiency more relevant to them. So that's, sorry, where the multiple benefits comes in. So this is our flower. It's the famous flower. I don't know if you've seen it before. But um, um, basically, the multiple benefits of energy efficiency has four objectives. We want to raise awareness for energy efficiency. We want to increase the analytical substance that's going on in energy efficiency. It's incredibly, it's incredibly broad, and there's a lot of different ways you can attack it, as this flower demonstrates. We want to identify further methodological tools for you, and then you know we want to build capacity and, and increase kind of the scholarship, the canon on, around uh, energy efficiency takes place with an eye to making policy makers, to making policy easier for you, for you to go to policy makers and say, hey, energy efficiency isn't some foofy hippie idea. These are really um, important, and these are measurable benefits. Key word here is measurable. We're not just picking things out of the air. The multiple benefits report really tries to collate the existing research, and we've done research of our own, to describe what the quantifiable benefits are of energy efficiency. So of that 18, you know, there's a lot of overlap in that kind of thing, but of the 18, <clears throat> we've tried, we, we decided to tackle five. Each one of these is a huge piece of, piece of work uh, in and of itself, but of the five we looked at, you know, they were public budgets, energy delivery, uh, the macroeconomic impacts. Oh, there's Lisa. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just talking about you. <laughs> Here's this um, uh, uh, The health and industrial productivity. So I'll just we'll just get a little bit into each one. It's all in the report, and uh, you know uh, we're feeling generous. And so if you send us an email, we can definitely get hook you up with one of the reports um, at, at a later date. Um, <clears throat> so, oops, there we go. So. Um, <clears throat> Energy delivery, uh, energy system operators. What energy efficiency does is, is it provides valuable overhead, uh, valuable overhead, basically, to uh, to energy efficiency to energy system operators. Um, this is an area of, of of research and interest that we're pursuing right now. Uh, the role of energy efficiency within the utility business model and how we can prioritize. Utilities are non-trivial investors in energy efficiency for the most part, and uh, and how can we actually monetize these benefits? So as you see here, I mean, there's a it's really a litany of benefits, much more than the cost of new generation from energy efficiency. The question is really how do we create a business model and regulatory framework to have that happen? And that's so, uh, my, my, my point here being is that we are definitely interested in this and where this is an area of further inquiry uh, in the market report 2015, which I'll get in near the end. But first benefit, extremely valuable to an energy system, energy system operators. <clears throat> Uh, the next one is industrial productivity. You know, this is basically a case study analysis, an analysis of different uh, research efforts that have looked into industries that have invested more in industrial productivity. Uh, one of the best uh, pieces of analysis uh, that's actually not in the chapter, but uh, that, that came out shortly thereafter was in Australia, where they looked at kind of the top, the top five, uh, a quartile investment in energy savings among industry. And those in the top quartile were, on average, 22% more profitable 
uh, those in the top quartile of energy efficiency investments were 22% more profitable than the mean uh, in that industry. So industrial productivity, I mean, uh, basically each, in, each dollar invested in uh, energy savings in industry, we estimate creates $2.5 dollars of value from, from productivity improvements in industry. So it's a potentially huge source of uh, competitiveness improving uh, and, you know, business security and resilience improving of major industries, which, you know, uh, each country has somewhat of a general policy focus on, um, in, especially in the OECD countries. Uh, healthcare, the health benefits of energy efficiency uh, really are what has stolen the show, and um, uh, and and there's there's there's, there, there's reason for that. I mean, there's real epidemi epidemiological research that can quantify health benefits to a very uh, tight resolution, to very specific uh, uh, resolution. And, and and what we found is is that uh, uh, there, there hasn't been a, a number of of research efforts looking at what energy efficiency is saving in health, but there's a, a couple key examples, especially in New Zealand where that 99% uh, uh, of the benefits of the warm-up New Zealand program, 99% of the net benefits were from health improvements, savings in health costs actually to the health system. This is uh, one of the things we like to really focus on is how multiple benefits helps cross-pollinate uh, between departments, government departments especially, and how multiple benefits um, allows energy efficiency policymakers to come to, like, to come to the cabinet table and to present energy efficiency in a more holistic, multi-department kind of way. You know, when we're engaging on health uh, programs, how can energy efficiency factor into that? When we're looking at industrial programs, industrial policy, how energy efficiency places. These are all ways that energy departments themselves can have a greater role, uh, that we, we believe that they can have a greater role around the government table, around the cabinet table, and on the government agenda. <clears throat> There's a lot on this slide, but basically energy efficiency improves public budgets. Uh, one of the most directly, you know, uh, government spending in and of itself, improving their own buildings, uh, is a very useful lever, very direct action that governments can take. And what we found is, is that, you know, um, energy efficiency, for every dollar invested, you get another two dollars back in energy savings. So they, they more than pay for themselves uh, from the government side of the ledger. You know, this is trying to ring true for people in finance and treasury departments, that kind of thing, saying, you know, this is, this is real, this will improve our balance sheet, this will improve our financial statements. Um, I won't get deeply into all this, but, you know, if you want the report, um, uh, we evaluate this at length. <clears throat> you know, macroeconomic impacts, this is, you know, we're getting larger and larger, headier and headier. But um, <clears throat> the basic idea is, is that, you know, energy efficiency is, is essentially one of the main tenets of capitalism, in a way. You know, it's doing more with less. It's becoming more productive, needing less energy inputs. Energy is basically a foundational piece of economic and human activity. You don't do anything without energy inputs. So the more that you do with the less energy that you consume, essentially the more productive you're, you're becoming. Um, there's a huge range of different uh, estimates on how much uh, extra economic productivity you're getting from energy efficiency. But, you know, uh, one, one prominent study that we looked at says that for every dollar invested to reduce primary energy demand in a country, you were getting anywhere from 0.9 to $3.5 in more value added, more output of your economy. So there's, there's a real key message here in that the more efficient you become, basically the wealthier that, 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 that the more wealth you're able to generate. <clears throat> so just to summarize the multiple benefits, I mean, <laughs> there, this isn't just on energy savings. There's a whole wealth of it. Um, one of the, the, the examples I like to, to, to bring up is, is actually from native Canada is, uh, you know, Manitoba Hydro built what they brag as one of the most energy efficient commercial building in the world. And um, <clears throat> they sold this to the government saying, you know, on a typical on a typical payback period, this is going to pay back in 35 years. This highly energy efficient building, not great. Okay, they said, but we think that there's a lot of multiple benefits uh, to be had. And actually, prior to building the new building, they had consciously tracked uh, missed health days, uh, sick days from from missed employees, uh, average employee productivity, da 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 da. 
they found that actually once we incorporate all these new benefits into this highly efficient building, the payback period reduced itself down to about 10 years, from 35 to 10 years. And these are real. You know, this is not the uh, employee outlays, these kind of, uh, you know, these liabilities are real on Manitoba Hydro's balance sheet. And that's how they, that's how they did it. So it's not even really about energy savings. It's about all of the other benefits that it's providing. And, uh, you know, this is just a cursory scan of, of, what, of what it is that, that we've looked at in this report. So <clears throat> what is our recommendations on multiple benefits? Well, basically, uh, we need to start using this, this type of policy lens uh, when making energy efficiency policy. Um, we need to uh, basically be innovative. There is no... There's no set framework. There's no. There's no. There's no gospel on on uh, on how to do multiple benefits. But uh, that means that there's that we owe it to ourselves to kind of be innovative and incorporate these benefits in how or which way that we're both selling and developing policy. And that uh, basically more work needs to happen to start gravitating into uh, uniform definitions on how to how to how to evaluate the benefits in and of itself. So that's where the IEA. Uh, is, is going on our multiple benefit work. We want to uh, basically spread this out, have other organizations in different countries try this. We, we feel like we've kind of stuck our neck out on this in a way, um, and we want other people to then feed back to us what, what the best ways to do it are, and we're very interested in convening and, and holding sessions to uh, get more uniformity or get more agreement on what the best way forward is on multiple benefits. So that's multiple benefits. I mean, um, that's actually, I wasn't directly involved in that. This is kind of what my ballywick is, which is the Energy Efficiency Market Report. Again, the Energy Efficiency Market Report is another effort to put, you know, bullets in the chamber for policy uh, analysts to go to policymakers, decision makers, and say, hey, this is real. Let's start doing some real innovative policy here. So this was the very first uh, Energy Efficiency Market Report. R report. It was in 2013. Um, I'm not responsible for that cover. And here's, look at that. <laughs> There's uh, the 2014 market report, um, which is what uh, Lorcan and I primarily worked on and which, which, which I managed. So uh, the, the first question is, why do we evaluate a market for energy efficiency? Well, um, because we have market reports for all of these fuels. And I guess where I'm going is, is that we also believe at the IEA that energy efficiency should be considered a fuel. And the more base aspect, and we were talking just over coffee before this, is, is trying to make energy efficiency sexy. Well, you know, um, um, uh, I don't know if talking about it with a room full of policy analysts will ever make it sexy, but the, the way that, you know, people talk about gas and pipelines and macho and billions of dollars and infrastructure and ah... You know, um, uh, what we want to say is actually energy efficiency has that same type of market framework. It's, dispute, it, it's, it's diffuse and disaggregated, but there's the still same volumes of capital, of cash, of money, of research and development going into energy efficiency, just as there is on shale gas production and pipelines and all the renewable energy, all of that. Energy efficiency is right there with them, as we will show you. So, <clears throat> oh, that chart didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, it's kind of the notes you don't hear. Um, the, the, what this shows is this is a graph from the WIO 2012 uh, World Energy Outlook. And th this, said, this is how the United States was going to become uh, uh, fossil fuel independent by 2035. And this is a big headline in the WIO 2012, fossil fuel independence. Wow, my God. This is all about tight oil. This is all about shale gas. This is all about these bright guys, these capitalists and roughnecks and all of that, you know, doing that. And so, um, oh no, okay, so <laughs> that is that, that new supply is that, is those various shades of violet there. That is what new supply is providing to make sure the, the United States becomes energy independent. There's a whole other wedge there, and guess what it is? That's energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is actually a larger wedge to uh, reduce net imports to the point that the United States becomes fossil fuel independent. But that didn't make the, the headlines. That didn't make the press release of the WIA. That wasn't what people were talking about. But actually, it's larger. It's real. It is, it is, it, th those, uh, the adoption of energy, efficiency st energy efficient stock is what is the greater wedge 
to achieve uh, oil independence for the United States, at least according to the WEO's model. Um, how big is that? Well, here's, oh boy, I guess this is a Mac issue. Uh, so this goes back to 1973, and up at the end there is 2011. Um, and this shows uh, for 11 of the major IEA countries, representing about 74% of energy demand in the IEA, um, the evolution of total final consumption and uh, the consumption of all fuels. And uh, right there is the savings from energy efficiency over that time. So what that shows is the gradual adoption of more energy efficient stock in all of our end use sectors. So our more energy, more energy efficient vehicles, more energy efficient uh, TVs. So instead of you know those big giant cathode ray TVs, we have plasma TVs and all of that. This gradual adoption over the past four decades has produced more in savings than the consumption of any one fuel. And in fact, the savings from energy efficiency are about 60% of total final consumption for those 11 IEA countries. Um, what's really important is that, that that gray line there is total final consumption since 1973. And if you look at it, it's actually relatively flat. And the reason for that basically is energy efficiency. Had we not improved the efficiency of all of our end use energy consuming stock, total final consumption would have been about 60% higher, hypothetically speaking. Now, if there's economists in the room, you're probably breaking out in cold sweats by me saying that, saying that prices would adjust and that um, you know, we, would have, we wouldn't have consumed that much more energy. That's true, but actually what would have happened is that our welfare just would have been a lot lower. Our energy prices would have been higher and we just wouldn't have been doing nearly as much with energy. So that's what energy efficiency is enabling for us. So that's kind of the starting point for the market report. That savings, all of that adoption is a real market. That is what, uh, you know, that's the people buying new TVs, new homes, more efficient homes, more efficient uh, heaters, all of that. That's money that's being spent. So let's try and quantify it. Let's try and say like, hey, what, what, is, what does this really mean in context to the other fuels? You know, how big is this market? So what we found is actually the market is, is very large indeed. It's about 310 to 360 billion. It's conceptual, and what we what we've what we've talked about is you know um, uh, very much it's it's definitional in how you d define what the market is, and then that will define or that will that will that will zero in on what type of, of value that, that you create for it. But you know we've ran this by a number of experts, and we, and we do believe this is a sound estimate of, of about 300 billion, um, which means that energy efficiency is still the first fuel in the 11 IEA countries which then leads us to, to say that that's probably the first fuel globally, and that the market itself is diffuse, extensive, and anticipated to grow. So here's the content of the market report for this year. We look at you know, how to value the market. We track progress on energy efficiency indicators for uh, 26 IEA countries, Ireland being one of them. Uh, we, look, we take a deep dive on the transport sector. Uh, it's often overlooked in energy efficiency, but transport is a huge uh, source of potential energy efficiency improvements. And then we take a look at energy efficiency finance. That's part one. And then part two, we profile 11 countries. We'll get, we'll get into that uh, briefly near the end of the report, near the end of the presentation, excuse me. So um, we did about six different methodologies to try and estimate how big the energy efficiency market was. And if you're dying to know, we, I can send you a copy of the report. Uh, I won't bore you with, with the details though, only to say is that um, uh, all six methodologies were around the 320 billion um, uh, number. Um, they were top-down methodologies, so again, if you're an economist, you might say, aha, top-down is always overestimates. What does the bottom-up methodology say? Well, the Global Energy Assessment had done the bottom-up methodology, and they estimated it was $298 billion. So, we, we feel 300 billion is a, is a very safe estimate. And what's interesting about this graph here is this is a Monte Carlo kind of histogram of, of various uh, changes in parameters for and definitional parameters for what uh, the energy efficiency market is. And it's decidedly asymmetrical. So we see that actually it's, 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 it's likely or potentially likely that the energy efficiency market is larger, not smaller than 300 billion. If it's 320 billion, then that's how, that's how it that's how it uh, compares to the other investments in the other energy fuels. So it would be the second largest market next to upstream oil and gas. 
just to put that those savings in context, uh, you know, the past 15 years have been the discussion on the global energy system has been dominated by the role of the rise of giants, China, India, and the like, and what they're doing, that extra demand is doing to the global energy system. Well, within that same time frame, where, uh, energy efficiency savings are removing basically a major economy's worth of energy demand from the system. So this is, this is, a, this is a major part that's shaping our global energy system that's often going up, uh, overlooked, which leads us to say that this is the invisible powerhouse of the, of the global energy system. If going back to 1973, as I said, is too far back, is that, if that's too ancient history for you, then we actually did a, another analysis that looked, okay, well, let's just look at energy efficiency savings over the past decade, since 2001. What, is the, what have those produced? We were able to expand the number of countries we looked at with, from 11 to 18 because of the more availability, of the greater data availability. And we found that you know, cumulative savings from energy efficiency over the decade was about 1,700 million tons of oil equivalent. So that's greater than the total final consumption of the United States and Germany combined in 2011. How did we do this type of analysis? Well, this is where Emer comes in. She, she helped us with a lot of this. Uh, um, is that uh, we basically decomposed total final consumption for uh, 1898 countries. Total final consumption, the consumption of energy, is basically a product of various different drivers. Those large drivers are the economic population growth, structural change, what, what, the, what the relative makeup of our economies are, and changing efficiency. So, if only our uh, population and economy grew or changed since, since, since 2001. That is what our hypothetical energy consumption would have been. Uh, approximately 7% higher. If, if our, the structure of our economy has changed, this is, you know, uh, the, 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 outs, the offshoring, as they say, of manufacturing, the, the, all of that, the, the, the growth of the commercial sector, the growth of the services sector, uh, this is how uh, the blue line is how TFC would have changed. Interestingly, you know, it didn't really change up until 2007, yet total final consumption was flat. Why is that? Well, because of changing efficiency. Efficiency basically offset the rise of uh, growth of our economy and population almost one to one, keeping TFC flat. So that's, you know, that's the important role that it plays. After 2007, it's a bit difficult to, to glean a lot of insight. The, the recession, you know, as you would well know here, really kind of threw everything for a loop. And, uh, you know, this year we're going to look at 2012 and hopefully we can get some, some, some greater insight into like what the, if are we into a new phase of energy demand, did, did the recession kind of kickstart us into something else, or are we going to resume back to normal consumption patterns? So here's how a bunch of countries uh, rate. You know, uh, interesting to note is that of the 12 of the 1898 countries that we looked at, efficiency savings were greater over the decade than the growth of GDP or the growth of our, and the growth of our population. You know, this, these are early evidence that potentially we are decoupling economic growth uh, from energy demand, and it's thanks to efficiency. Oops. Um, just looking very quickly at the transport market, it's a huge market, it's a huge potential for energy efficiency. What we see is that policy is really going to drive this. So 70% of the global new vehicle fleet will be subject to energy efficiency standards. That's, you know, about 50 million vehicles. The story of the transport market, though, is really in the non-OECD. As you can see in, the, in both charts, um, excuse me, passenger kilometers and ton kilometers are basically flat in the, in the OECD, but globally they're continuing to rise almost all from the non-OECD region. In the transport chapter, we get, you, know, you can get into these kind of high-minded philosophical discussions of what is efficiency. You know, is efficiency just the, efficient, the efficiency of your powertrain, or is it the efficiency of the system? Is it the efficiency by which we're meeting energy service demand? And uh, we go back and forth on you know, what, what should we count as part of the energy efficiency market. You know, one story is, if you only, if you only cared about you know the the engineering efficiency of your of your drivetrain of, of of converting chemical energy into motive power, then we would all be flying around in airliners because they're you know incredibly efficient engines. But actually, they're not efficient at satisfying our energy service demand, which is to move around, to go to work, to meet people, to be social, enjoy entertainment, all of that. And so here we are. Here we see. Uh, sorry about these charts. I, uh, I, I, I blame Macintosh. Um, 
but that freight and passenger rail can basically move a ton of goods or a person around at one tenth of the energy. Um, and so included in this chapter is we look at investments in public transit, look at investments in alternate transport, transport infrastructure that doesn't prioritize vehicles. It's relatively small right now, it's about 195 billion. And it's not direct, it's not directly, it's, it's very tenuous to say that if you build uh, transport infrastructure, then all of a sudden you're going to get a lot of people switching modes, but it is essential. It's, it's not enough, but it's necessary, if that makes any sense. And, uh, and, and we think this is going to be a big potential market, especially in the non-OECD region. Uh, China itself has invested $160 billion in a high-speed rail network over the past five years. This high-speed rail network is longer than all other high-speed rail networks in the world combined. And so we definitely think that these are investments in efficiency. Can you concern about time? Sure. Um, I will. Uh, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, well, I just wanted to leave time for questions and answers. So we've, we've gone about half an hour in, so I'd say another 15 or 20 minutes with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'll go very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, uh, thanks a million anyway, Tyler, for that. Yeah. And, um, I think one of the words you used was invisible and uh, energy efficiency as an invisible powerhouse. And I think it's uh, part of the work you're doing is to make it more visible. And I think it's some very, very interesting work. Yeah. And it's great to welcome Larkin back to the Institute. He's been here as a, <laughs> as a guest yeah. on many an occasion. And uh, he's been working, I believe, on the energy efficiency market report also yeah. for the last year since uh, rejoining um, uh, the IEA. If that's, yeah. If that's yeah. Right. yeah, I did work previously in the IEA yeah. in, in another role and kind of come back. So do you. So this is uh, still part of the energy efficiency market report presentation. This is the... Uh, the second thematic focus chapter that uh, we did. So along with transport, we took a more in-depth look at energy efficiency finance. And this is a really um, interesting and, and exciting part of the, of the market picture. There's a lot happening around the world. It's, uh, energy efficiency is expanding as a segment within energy efficiency finance. And there's a lot of innovation taking place to try and overcome um, barriers to energy efficiency investment that you're all familiar with, the upfront costs, payback times. So there's a lot of innovation happening in areas like energy performance contracting, where an energy service company will say, we'll take on the risk, we'll guarantee the savings, and we'll pay ourselves out of some of the, uh, the financial savings that accrue. Um, also areas like on-bill financing, so repaying investments through your utility bill or through, in some countries, your local tax bill. And so all of this is uh, taking place around the world and, and being scaled up. Um, two kind of qualifiers, so one is that we shouldn't, in talking about finance and all, this, all these exciting business models, forget that most investment is still people stumping up um, for an energy efficient product out of their own cash and savings. It's businesses deciding to make an energy efficiency investment with their own capital. It's governments uh, funding energy efficiency investment out of public funds. So while we do need uh, to focus on reducing um, barriers to energy efficiency finance and scaling that up, also not forgetting the, the demand side. There needs to be demand for energy efficiency for there to be projects to finance. But having said that, um, that still leaves, based on our 310, 320, market size that still is about 120 billion uh, of finance. Um, a lot of that will still be provided by commercial banks, classic loan products, traditional lending. Um, even in that sector though, uh, we see that not only are banks uh, thinking, okay, we can loan for energy renovation, we can loan for various uh, different energy efficiency investments, but also strategically they're starting to think you know, a company, if we have a client and if they're, they've got very high energy bills, that increases their risk profile. So we can actually reduce the risk of our portfolio overall by paying more attention to energy efficiency. Um, so one area in particular, energy performance contracting, um, that's really growing a lot around the world. I'll only put up this slide just to show you then the, the spread of countries involved. And something you might not have guessed would be that China has uh, got the biggest market in the world. It's been a, a huge factor in how they've increased the energy efficiency of their industry sector. So the second kind of half of the report is the country case studies. We won't be going through all of these. Um, 
So we decided we chose particular countries and looked at them in more detail to see, in reality, on the ground, what does all this look like, all this uh, market analysis and market size analysis that we did. So not surprising again, China, huge investments. Um, just in one five-year period, those savings are more than the total final energy consumption of a country like Canada, for example. So it's a huge, huge chunk of savings and huge investments to come in the current five-year plan. It's 200 to 270 billion dollars. Um, a common theme across a couple of the chapters was LED lighting. Um, you can see these exponential growth numbers in countries like Thailand and Japan um, and starting to happen in other countries. You can imagine how big those numbers would be once India starts to move from CFLs to, to LED lighting. And it's also a chapter on Ireland um, with which, uh, on which we um, received inputs and collaborated a little bit with, uh, with the department and with SEAI. Um, I'd only maybe draw attention to just the energy intensity curve. It's the lower curve on the right-hand side, um, which shows that even while Ireland was experiencing strong economic growth, we were managing to reduce our energy intensity. Um, there is an uptick during the recession, um, especially in the industry sector. Um, then it comes back down, and the latest, kind of, the latest year we have, it's flat. So this may be a question mark to be inserted there next as to What's going to happen next? Are we going to turn, bend that curve back down, or is it, is it going to stay flat, or is it going to worsen? So we don't do projections in this <laughs> report, but that's the question for you. It's, I'm sure it would be interested, I'm sure you have thoughts. Um, we also did a decomposition, so just as at world level, um, we did the decomposition. We also did one um, for the countries for which data was available, including Ireland. So again, you can see uh, TFC has been brought down or held down uh, by efficiency and also structure to a lesser extent, in particular in the residential sector, um, where efficiency improved by over 20% over the decades to 2011. Um, finally then, in the chapter, we also give uh, some of the policy context that may help to explain some of those trends. Um, EU policy is still a major driver for policy in Ireland, as in other member states. Um, it's the energy efficiency obligation scheme being set up, energy performance certificates in buildings. Um, but there's also a lot of really interesting policies uh, at national level in various sectors as well. Um, I'm not going to describe or explain them all to you. That's, that's something I'm sure you could all do better than I could. Um, but just to say that it's, it's, uh, there's a comprehensive spread of policies, I think. Um, maybe the, the question for discussion is how is the uptake doing or how is the implementation in reality? Um, maybe too early for some of these policies, but that's again something we could discuss. Um, and so all of that, is, as we've been saying, is um, to try and say, well, look, here's two new ways of looking at the energy efficiency market that could help, um, thinking of it as a, as a market, as an investment opportunity, and then also the multiple benefits. So... Um, I think that's maybe a good point to to circle back and, and have some questions and answers. Thank you.